I'm going to start talking by talking a little bit about um, the historical um, black self-organizing that has happened in the UK. My presentation will mainly focus on uh, England, um, which is we can discuss in more depth later. Um, and I'll mainly be talking about self-organizing that has been decolonial feminist and internationalist slash pan-Africanist in its making. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about where anti-capitalism and Marxism uh, intersects with um, that, that kind of self-organizing. Um, so I'll start with the history, and as we get kind of closer to present day, I'll dive it slightly more into the like complexities and nuances that we see in black self-organizing um, in the UK context. Um, yeah, thinking about how it's perceived, how it anchors itself, how it's responded to the role that it plays, um, and the kind of how it makes change, what kind of change it makes, and the challenges that come with it. Um, so similar to, to BAFTA, I think my first thought when I thought about when did self-organization begin in the UK was probably longer ago than there is documentation for. Um, I, I'm a big fan of a historian called Kessua John, partly because she's my sister, partly because she's excellent. Um, and she writes a lot about, she has her, her area is around the 1920s and 30s, but she writes a lot about um, how history is not, progress is not linear in the way that we often think about it as being. Uh, things don't gradually get better and better, they get better and then they get worse for a bit and then they get kind of better and even worse and then even better. And so trying to think of, of history through that lens as well, um, the first things that, that, that she actually shared with me was around evidence of black self-organizing which dates back to 1772 um, with something called the Somerset Judgment uh, where it became illegal for black for uh, people in England to own um, slaves. Um, and there's evidence that there was a group of up to 50 people meeting every week. Um, and at the event of this judgment, there was an event at which 200 people gathered, which we can deduce was a celebration of this judgment that they'd been lobbying for. Um, and so while it's quite difficult to get hard evidence of, of uh, black self-organizing as far back as the uh, 18th century. Can you hear me okay with this mic? Um, it is there. Um, and that goes on to the 1790s. There's more kind of well-known people such as Alado Equiano, um, Ignatius Sanchez, slightly more well-known, but still quite um, niche, I would argue, um, who founded the uh, an abolitionist movement called the Sons of Africa, which kind of brings me to my second point around how um, black self-organizing is understood um, with the evidence that is available in terms of the role of women and how gender is described and presented in history. Um, and I think whilst there's an organization called the Sons of Africa, I feel quite confident that it was not only men that were involved. Um, and so also reading Again, this is much inspired by the work of Kessler John. Reading history with that lens of you never really know someone's gender first and foremost, um, and you never know who's not being documented and who's not being spoken about. And often those people might be um, women or people of uh, gender non-conforming people, people of oppressed genders. Um, yes, that is preamble. Um, and so let's skipping ahead to the 20th century. Um, there's loads of activity that happens around the 1920s and 30s in the UK. There is the Pan-African Conference, there's the Negro Progress Union, the Nigerian Progress Union, that later becomes the West African Students' Union, the Negro Welfare Association, and the League of Coloured People. Um, so from kind of 1920s and 30s, you have very active black organising, as I say, that was already going on. You have very well-documented and active black organising. Um, going on and a lot of that is the kind of inception of not inceptions may be too strong but it's the beginnings of the movement around um, anti-colonialism so the organizations that were formed in the 1920s and 30s will have been um, outposts or solidarity campaigns or active in shaping the narrative around how and why colonialism should and would eventually come to an end um, and that and then in the 50s and 60s, you obviously see the kind of wave of decolonization. And then therefore those organizations which were founded with that kind of politics at its core, that intention at its core, fall to the side and new things come and move and shape. Um, 
And another thing to, yeah, so I think my first kind of reflection on the kind of self-organizing that you see in the UK is there's a rapper called Kano from East London who on his first album has a really great song, if you ever get a chance to listen to it, called How We Living. And I think that for me, both the title of the song and the song itself is like this meditation on how do we, how can we be, how can we exist, how can we survive in this society? And I think a lot of black self-organization um, has focused on meeting of material needs. And I'll go into more depth breaking down the ways in which we see that and the lenses through which that's done um, a bit later in the presentation. Um, but the, for example, the Negro Welfare Association, um, the League of Colored People, a lot of that is about um, protecting the interests of black people on a education, housing, employment, survival kind of level. Um, and what often intersects with that is, is um, policing activity because protection of black peoples often means um, protection from the state and the state body that is most commonly on the daily enforcing um, the violence of the state is often represented by police. As I'm saying that, I'm like, and also housing and employment and also many other things. So nuances and complexities, but I think that's the way in which we often relate to policing struggles. Um, and so one of the, again, um, a, a note on some of, a lot of my sister's work is around um, Amy Ashwood and Amy Jacques Garvey, who are often known as um, wives of Marcus Garvey, but who are also organizers in their own right. And a lot of the most, most more successful um, civil rights activity that went on in the 20s and 30s um, was, was linked to the work of Amy Ashwood Garvey specifically around the West African Students' Union. So there's that lobbying piece as well, as well as the kind of organizing communities to be self-sufficient um, and sustainable and to survive. There's also this active um, lobbying and, and fighting for rights in the kind of courts or um, at the state level. Um, and so onto this question of how important were connections to the African continent, the role of Pan-Africanism in um, black self-organization in the UK. Excuse me. Um, and the short answer to that is like hugely important. I think um, black self-organizing in the UK has always been due to forced displacement, migration, um, and transatlantic uh, slavery inherently internationalist because we there is no black liberation that is regional. It can only ever really be transnational because we're not, as a people, we're not geographically uh, enclosed. Um, and one great example of this is the International African Friends of Ethiopia, which was um, largely, again, Amy Ashwood Garvey and CLR James, who wrote The Black Jacobins. Um, and that was a real, I think that event in, I think, 1930s, if I'm right, uh, where the invasion of Italy, uh, it Italian invasion of Ethiopia, rather, triggered this kind of global um, response where a lot of Pan-Africanists and a lot of Pan-African organizations kind of um, strengthened, pushed forward um, through uniting against that. And again, speaks to how in the UK, black self-organizing has always been decolonial um, and internationalist in its nature often. Um, yeah, and then we're actually now just sort of at the, the 1945 onwards, which is 1945 was the um, Pan-African Congress in Manchester, which was, I believe George Padmore um, was one of the key players in that. And there's an uh, archive in um, North London called the George Padmore Institute, um, named for the organizer of the Pan-African Congress, but which actually houses the majority of the archives of the Caribbean artists movement in the 1960s, which I'll go on to speak about now. Um, so in the UK, there's a kind of a narrative um, that sort of like black presence started with the Windrush. Um, can I get a show of hand who's ever heard of the Windrush so I know how much to explain? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so the Windrush is um, the name of a ship that arrived from uh, the Caribbean to the UK, I believe in 1948. Um, and it's the kind of catch-all term for the wave of migration that happened from the Caribbean to the UK at that period. In my mother's words, thank you. Um, 
in my mother's words, uh, Caribbean people were begged to come over to the UK um, to rebuild um, after uh, the Second World War. And so, yeah, again, that's not historically accurate in terms of black presence existed before that, but it is a moment in black British history. Um, so the HMS Windrush arrives and with that, the landscape starts to shift. And as I said, because those movements of the 20s and 30s are now gaining success in that the um, colonialism is falling, states are becoming independent. There's a kind of a new era and emergent of like what becomes the norm, I guess, in, in black self-organizing. Um, so yeah, a lot in the 50s and 60s, what you see is the, how the role of art and media in UK um, self-organizing amongst black peoples becomes very concretized. So Claudia Jones founds um, the uh, Notting Hill Carnival, um, which is this kind of huge uh, thorn in the side of British society in that it's like an ex an expression of black beauty and joy and brilliance and it's Claudia Jones is a, um, a socialist she's a Marxist so she's very very the, it's very much founded with the politics in mind of of being a disruptive event uh, it's also uh, anyone who's ever been to carnival in the Caribbean not all of them but a lot of them are also very spiritual they're very evocative of um kind of yeah the spirits of black liberation and so there's really that intervention into black organizing of how do we, of, of how, yeah, art and expression becomes really concrete to maintaining. And, and it's really key to this day to the survival of how black people in the UK organize, is how we organize around art and through art. Um, and so, as I said, the Caribbean artist movement was then in the 1960s, which was, um, and all of that, a lot of the archives from that time are housed in the G in the George Padmore Institute that I mentioned. Um, and again, it's this like very thin line. It's like literally the same people who are in the Caribbean artist movement who are also in, I can't remember what it's called, but it's the organizing committee um, around the Black People's Day of Action, which was the kind of biggest march of black people um, in London that went from New Cross in Southeast London to central London following the death of um, 14 young people at a party that was set on fire. Um, that they suspected was a racist attack, but the police didn't investigate it. So there was this big protest. Um, and yeah, so that you have this, this, this very thin line between black organizers and black artists. Um, and a lot of media that also emerges from this time. So Race Today was a part of what came out of the Black Power Movement. Um, the Blacks, Bricks and Black Women's Group also had a newspaper. A lot of these organizations had outlets for shaping the narratives that then went on to shift um, public discourse. Um, and just skipping a little bit ahead. Um, yeah, again, the, the role of Pan-Africanism continues to be key in the black power movement. Um, and at that time, one thing that's important to note, sorry, I'm getting some feedback, um, is that Black organizations, a lot of black organizations at that time, the majority would, would, were what we call politically black, which was that they were um, both often led by people of African descent, but people, for example, of South Asian descent, Bengalis, um, people from India, people from Pakistan, were also very prominent in those and identified as politically black. And that kind of fostered um, a collectivity in the way that people of color in the UK were organizing throughout like 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, and that died a death after the riots in the UK in the 1980s led to this report being written by the government, which basically said racism looks like it might be real. Um, so, so then loads of money became available to groups um, to be able to access if they were working on essentially like uh, well-being of their communities, but it was very much tied to exactly if you could identify which community. So there's this money for black people, there's mis this money for Indian people, there's this money for um, Bengali people. And that's kind of what kills political blackness um, in the 80s. And then it had a bit of a resurgence about 10 years ago, um, but quite quickly it kind of came back up and, and sort of fizzled out again. And I think now there's a lot more conversations on how uh, to 
conceive of systems of oppression of anti-blackness as similar but different from other forms of anti-racism. Cool, five minutes, let's go. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, again, um, role of women in these movements is incredibly important. Althea jones LeCoyne is the leader of the Black British Panthers um, throughout its existence. Um, Darkus Howe is probably the more, more known name of that era, um, but again, his spouses, Barbara Beast and Leila Hassan Howe, hugely key figures. Um, and actually what emerges from the Black Power movement is this split that I would argue you kind of can still see today where uh, essentially a lot of the women who didn't feel that uh, the Black Power movement was a space for them to um, be able to fully engage and manifest their politics went on to create separate feminist groups. The um, Bricks and Black Women's Group, Organization of Women of African and Asians is sent hugely successful groups, huge, like hugely networked, working out with loads of different women's groups, both locally in terms of um, women working on the front line and also holding huge conferences where um, kind of black feminist debate is is like on fire, basically. Um, and yeah, there is this kind of uh, gender split that you kind of get between the black power movement and then the black feminist movements that emerge from it. Um, so tools and tactics, I'll just speak quickly on what, what is it that, that black self-organizing in the UK does. So as I said, it's that often you can like map it across how people survive. So housing, Olive Morris who's one of the founders of the, the um, huge black feminist uh, from the 80s is looking at um, squatting. How do you sustain housing for black people through squatting? She develops the squatter's handbook, hugely well used. Squatting is how a lot of people ended up getting um, somewhere to live in a sustainable basis back in the 80s. People organizing money, people organizing collective coll collective saving. Um, education, black parents movement. Um, in 1971, Bernard Cord wrote the How the West Indian Child is Made Educationally Subnormal. Um, by the British schooling system, hugely influential still to this day. There's a group called No More Exclusion to work on um, anti-racism in schools. They still quote that book to this day. It's a, a really big and important um, shift. And so a lot of Saturday schools are set up because of that. A huge amount of organizing, especially in Manchester actually, um, is done around the Black Parents Movement in the 80s. Employment, so you've got the Bristol bus boycott which is where black people weren't allowed to drive buses. Black people stopped getting on the bus. The buses started wondering why the buses were empty. And so black people were then able to drive buses. Althea jones LeCoint, who ran the, black British, the British Black Panthers, also um, was a labor organizer who was founding, helping to found unions um, in London at the time. And again, policing. Um, in the 80s, we had what was called the sus laws. Today you have stop and search. It's a similar mechanism of over policing in black com communities. Um, and yes, so where are we today? Um, so yeah, I think, as I say, I think this. I think there, you still see those threads that have always carried through in the ways in which um, black organizing in the UK has been feminist, either either with feminists in bigger organizations, sort of like Althea Jones Lacoint, just pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing or that break off where you see black feminist groups quite clearly founding and creating their own spaces. Um, I think there's an interesting uh, dynamic in UK self-organizing um, amongst black peoples, which is this kind of what I would shorthand call like black Marxist versus black capitalists. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, black self organizing that is about the 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 kind of kind of what I would say like comes from that black power thread that's around um, self sufficiency, ec building economic power. My definition as an anti capitalist of economic power is about liberatory economic economies of the of social relations of labor of uh, exchange. But there's also another very like important to name thread. Um, in black organizing, which is more focused on meeting material needs in in in, a, in such a way that isn't necessarily anti-capitalist. Um, um, I think, yeah, there's still a lot of migrant and refugee led organizations in the UK doing a lot of work with migrants and refugees. Um, and that's my time. Please may I have one minute? <laughs>
Um, still a lot of links to the con the continent organizations like Ubele. There's interestingly still a lot of links specifically to Ethiopia. Also a lot of links um, to Gambia. Um, the uh, Ukraine during uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, there was a lot of mobilization around supporting Africans in Ukraine. In the same way that there's kind of there's always that sense of like wherever we are, we can be supporting each other. Um, and then just quickly on the links to the US and and what's the the model of African American civil rights and how that impacts in the UK. I think there's a complex question, which I, I probably couldn't do very much justice at all to in 60 seconds. I would say the model is not that you, is not that used. I don't think we use the same model of um, community organizing and, and campaigning for civil rights. I do think there is, like the British Black Panthers, like Black Lives Matter UK, there is that kind of echo, um, which I think is both powerful and also sometimes is a bit of a honey trap. Um, in that I think it, uh, where black self-organizing um, in the UK is less defined or less, essentially I think there sometimes blurs the line of what, what of, of which issue we're talking about. Um, and so there's, and it's also, there's some contentions I think in, especially in the role that the UK plays in Europe more broadly with like the, yeah, I don't want to talk about Brexit, but it's there. Um, <laughs> And so I think there is sometimes an over attachment to what's happening in the US when I think my personal view is that that needs to be undermined and more prioritizing where we are geographically and also more centering. I think Pan-Africanism needs to center Africa and I think centering the US in a Pan-Africanist organizing can often distract us from uh, our understanding of who we are. Um, I'll stop. <laughs>